Hello and welcome to the latest of our podcasts on cost of living issues. Now, since we last met, there's been a huge amount of change. And uh, yeah, we now have an entirely new leadership who've got an awful lot of things in their inbox. So today we are joined by Mark Edwards, who's going to talk you through, along with Hannah, the latest findings that we've got from our survey that, that we carried out at the beginning of the month. So that will give a whole load of insights into how people are actually perceiving the cost of living challenges at the moment. As you're aware from pre watching previous podcasts, we're also getting information from our scenario tool, which I'll talk about at the end in terms of what we think, how we think it's going to impact different demographic groups. And last month, uh, we were joined by Rachel, who was talking about what we're seeing in actual transaction data in terms of how people are changing their spend patterns. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Hannah and to Mark. Over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so what we're going to be talking about today is this, this big kind of UK national survey that we've run. Um, it's consistent with the one that we ran in March. Um, so I think what I'll probably start off doing is just talking you through what's changed uh, since the last time we talked to people, because a lot of the questions were consistent. So we've been able to track the changes. Um, obviously, when we were going into this at the beginning of the summer um, in March, there was a lot of stirring about the cost of living. Um, concern was ramping up and we saw a lot of evidence of that in our survey um, and in various sentiment questions that we asked. But we were facing summer and um, we ended up having the hottest summer on record, I believe it was. Um, and we had a lot of particularly young people um, having their first kind of real summer break in the last two years um, because of, I guess, the, the pandemic and the disruption that caused previously. So what we were picking up was, yes, we are concerned. Um, but that's not going to stop us from going to restaurants, going to pubs, doing our shopping um, and I guess making up for lost time in some senses. Now, we know that, um, for example, non-essential spend went up by 38 percent over the course of summer, uh, which is really significant. So we really did see that um, stimulation into the economy, despite the fact that costs started soaring. Um, we've now talked to people at the end of the summer when uh, the news cycles have, have persisted and we've continued to see um, negative headlines about how much everything's going to cost, particularly energy, but also things like food inflation um, and everything else. So what we've seen, for example, are some really worrying stats. Um, the one that kind of really stuck out to me was the fact that so at the beginning of at the beginning of summer, one in 20 people said that they expected to use a food bank over the next 12 months. Now, last week when we talked to people, um, that was one in 10. So double the amount of people that we spoke to at the beginning of summer are now expecting to use a food bank, which is which is really alarming, really worrying. And I think it just reminds us all um, of the human impact of, of life becoming this expensive and what it's going to mean for people. Um, particularly impacted, of course, are those uh, middle and lower income groups, um, particularly those with dependents at home and particularly those um, of that kind of middle age bracket that have a lot of responsibility, have high outgoings. Um, so we're going to continue to monitor that. But there are some worrying signs that people are you know, people are going to really, really struggle to make their ends meet in the next couple of months. So another thing that we found um, over the course of the summer, which is another alarming thing. So we had people, some people left in the population that said that they had savings left over from the pandemic. Um, those people that were able to stay in their employment um, and were able to make cost savings uh, during the lockdowns. Now, what we've seen is that half of those people have burnt through those savings over summer. Um, spending them on various things, whether that's the, the bill increases or other kind of leisure activities, um, which brings us on to kind of the impact on people's finances, Mark, which I know you've done a bit of digging into. So what, what have you found there? Yeah, um, in addition to reductions in saving, I think we've seen consistently through the summer that evidence that people are going to start to turn to retail finance providers to help them through this period with credit. Uh, it's variable across the population, but we found much more inclination among the younger groups and also the least affluent to turn to personal loans, to credit cards and to find their pay later options to finance their lifestyles. So when we looked at the, the least affluent ACORN categories, financially stretched and urban adversity, one in five of those thought they would turn to buy now, pay later in the coming months as the impact of the uh, cost of living continues. And in addition to that, 18% anticipate going overdrawn. But that raises 
by a third to 24% among millennials. And, and as the Bank of England tries to curb inflation, they're gradually turning up the dial on interest rates too. And that's going to have an impact on, on, on home ownership. So I think we're going to see that in two ways. There'll be a slowdown in new home purchases, but also some difficult uh, decisions for those people who are looking to remortgage. So firstly, while we sense that people have been quick to move to new fixed rate mortgages before rates picked up uh, at the start of this year, some have decided to walk away from house purchases altogether. 58% um, of people who said that they were considering buying their first home in the next 12 months have also now told us that they're reconsidering that given the rising cost of living. And the same is also true of existing homeowners. 47% of those who are looking to buy a new home said they're now reconsidering that. So top line, around half of prospective house purchases are now under review. And that's likely to be due in large part to higher mortgage costs. But the second thing that we'll see is that people are going to be forced to make some really tough decisions when their existing fixed rate ends. So this applies to around a quarter of the population that we engage with. There are something in the order of 9 million mortgage households in the UK right now, and the majority of those are on fixed term deals. So in the survey, we asked them to consider what they might do when their existing fixed term ended, conscious that the interest rate they'd be expected to pay in the future would be much higher than that today. And less than half of them anticipated making no changes to their mortgage arrangements, saying that they find some other ways to cut down their costs. And that leaves more than half needing to find some other way to keep their repayments down. There are various devices they could they could do to, to do that, or perhaps they just simply don't know, but they don't uh, anticipate me, uh, uh, you know, leaving their mortgage as is. Uh, that might mean extending the overall term, say from 25 to 35 years or something, or perhaps even switching to interest only deals. But when you do some crude maths, it's not surprising that people are going to be forced into these sorts of changes. If we took the say the crude example of a first time buyer who, who took out a mortgage of 200,000 pounds, a monthly repayment on a 25 year mortgage with a rate of 2% would have been 850 pounds. And that would have been quite common perhaps a couple of years ago as, as people rushed to uh, to act before the stamp duty changes. If that rate hit 4%, then the monthly repayment would rise to more than 1,050 pounds. So that's an additional 200 pound burden every month that they'd be committing themselves to if they remortgaged potentially for the next two or five years. And I had a look this morning at the best buyers out there for first time buyers for a two year fixed term with uh, a mortgage of 200,000 pounds borrowed against a 300,000 pound property. Uh, the best rate out there at the moment is around 3.4%. And over a five year fixed term, it rises to nearly 3.6%. So these numbers are already two percentage points higher than they were just a year ago. The Bank of England base rate has already gone up by one and a half percentage points, and the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, is due to meet again mid September. And the general market expectation is it's going to rise to somewhere between two and a quarter and three percent during 2023. So mortgage rates have been very low for a long time, and there's definitely a risk that a lot of homeowners would have taken those for granted and face something of a shock in the near future. But at least in response to the survey, they've been saying they are thinking about doing something differently in order to tackle that. And I think, Hannah, you, you found some evidence of other areas. People have begun to adjust their behaviours already as well. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. We've been looking at kind of, um, I guess, of course, non-essential spend as well, how that behaviour is changing and, and will change in the future. I know Rachel spent a long time um, last month talking us through how um, various different categories of spend were changing and had changed over the summer. Um, we asked people in terms of spending cuts, what they would start to cut first so that we could kind of almost get to a sort of pecking order of where people were going to make those cuts in the first instance um, and what I mean the first thing that stuck out to me was we asked this at the beginning of summer and then of course um, very recently and um, that pecking order doesn't change um, so we've got a pretty robust list here of things that people are willing to strike off first when times get tough and and they don't have as much money top of that list was takeaways um, and that very much kind of aligns with recent press coverage we've seen of um, companies like Deliveroo um, kind of dropping in terms of share price um, and struggling a little bit as people are deciding, actually, we don't need this takeaway. Um, let's save our money for something else. 
Um, and, and just below the takeaways in that list are things like um, restaurant spend, leisure spend and clothing. Um, now, these are not categories that are going to completely vanish. What this means is that um, people are likely to be trading down, trading down, sorry, in terms of the brands that they're seeking out or purely just reducing their frequency. So it's not necessarily that this spending is going to cut altogether, but the type of spend is going to change um, quite significantly is I think in terms of that point that you made before Mark about that home buying so we I remember us saying in, in 2020 that we were expecting there to be a bit of a dip in homeware and DIY spend um, this year regardless because a lot of people made those home investments during the pandemic when they had not much else to do I think that is partly driving this drop in spend on DIY and home improvements. But then you've got the other side, Mark, that you alluded to where people are actually putting off making that next home move um, because of these soaring interest rates. Um, so it's, it's, it's a complicated picture, but a very, very interesting one in terms of how spend is changing. I guess um, to kind of throw it back to you, Mark, in terms of consumer sentiment and worry, um, what have you found there? Yeah, it's, it's really not going to be a, a huge headline that almost nobody expects to be unaffected by the rise of cost of living. And when we asked them recently, only 7% of people claimed that they weren't worried about their personal finances, which is a very small number. Um, more than half said that they were worried for their personal finances, and a large number of those who weren't worried for themselves were still worried for their family. In total, two thirds of people said they're worried for either their personal finances or those of their family members. And that rises to three quarters of people who are worried if that scope extends to the national and global economy. And as you talked about the cream, you know, various it, it changes in the, the government as, as well. These factors all play into uncertainty and concern that people have. Um, but if there's one group that struck an optimistic tone in their survey responses, it's definitely the, the younger demographic groups, in particular Gen Z, which are those born since 1997. In almost every respect, they stood out from the crowd in the survey. Uh, there were some areas where they were clearly gloomier. They, they expect to use financial institutions, as we talked about, and they reported as the most likely to cut back on their charitable donations. But in our other areas, the youngest group were a lot more positive. They're still planning um, holidays. They're still much less willing to give up on discretionary spend. You talked about takeaways. I think the, the break on... Gen Z was that only 40% of those were planning to cut back on takeaways compared with 60% across the rest of the population. And they also expect to save more in the next 12 months. And you, know, you talked about that earlier, Hannah. Uh, you know, these, these younger groups told us they're expecting their savings to grow compared with those in Gen X and older. Only 16% of Gen X and older are expecting their savings to grow. Half of Gen Z expecting their savings to grow in the next 12 months. That shines through when we use Acorn as a lens as well. So rising prosperity, which is the most affluent category of younger person, they're much likely, much less likely to cut their spending on home furnishings to come back to the point you're making about, um, about that area and, the, and home improvement. The, and they're also the least likely to cut back on one-off charitable donations and sponsorships. But people are overall concerned. They're still worried about the outlook for this winter. I know you want to drill into this in a bit more detail, Hannah. The, the, the headline, we saw that a, high, a surprisingly high number of people told us that they're worried about the cost of keeping warm and the possibility of going hungry. 36% um, of respondents said they're worried about going hungry this winter, and it doubles when we talk about the cost of keeping warm. So it's inevitable that people are going to look to cut their expenditure to manage that hit. Yeah, I think on that energy point, so it's it's 72 percent of people in the UK are worried about the cost of keeping warm. Now, I will caveat that um, that question was answered before Liz Truss's piece of um, new fiscal policy came into play. And I'll let talk, uh, let Paul talk about that um, in a second. But I think that fear of energy costs, I think what really stood out to me was how kind of universal that was. It wasn't a huge amount of variation by affluence there. And I think that's a really important thing about this, this cost of living crisis is it really is impacting everyone. It's not just an issue for those um, that have less to spend. It's 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 going to impact everyone. Um, regionally, it was, it was high in every region, but the Northeast, for example, was number one in terms of fear of that cost of energy. And that's unsurprising given that it, it is colder in the Northeast compared to um, down in London, for example. But yeah, universally, you see these 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 kind of very consistent levels Um, mature money starting out 
striving families and poorer pensioners were the most worried groups of them all. Um, so older groups, um, people that worried about keeping warm because um, they fall into an older demographic or those that have basically young families at home. So they uh, need to heat more rooms in the house, uh, for example. Um, Paul, I'll hand over to you because I know you've got a little bit more detail about that piece of policy and how it's impacted our, our spend scenario forecasts. Thanks, both of you. That's brilliant. OK, so yes, just just quickly. So, yes, we, as you're aware, we've been monitoring by ACORN how we think the impacts are going to impact, how the cost of living is going to impact each group. Now, I'm just going to quickly share a slide for those of you who have access to a screen. So this is the world that we were predicting before. This has been on our website for a little, little while. But basically, the redder it is, it's the larger the percentage impact that we're expecting people to feel compared to the beginning of the financial year, so in April. And this was the scenario before Liz Truss brought in her new price cap. So alarming amounts of red, particularly in the lower income groups. So the good news is when I share this, the September scenario that we literally have just run, and yet we don't have the full details of the proposed policy at the moment, but what it does is it considerably reduces the impact that people are facing. But remember, energy prices, whilst they've been getting a lot of headlines, they are not the only issue. The guys have just talked particularly about things like interest rises, rate rises, that we have also been feeding through our latest scenario and the increasing inflation. So we are still in a world where our estimates are that one in 10 households will still face drops of over 5% in their disposable income. So still a concerning situation. And we are also seeing huge variation on that demographically. So to give two stark comparison numbers, at the low end of the demographic spectrum, three in 10 struggling estate households look set to see a rise of over 5%. Compare that to three in 100 for the executive wealth. So huge differences and yeah, those demographic factors weren't really impacted by this trust's announcement. Earlier in the year, we have seen the extra rebate for the lower income groups, but the simple capping at £2,500, whilst it's due to help everyone, it doesn't differentially, differentiatedly support the lower income groups. So I'll stop sharing that now, but basically that is the world that we're at now. As Liz Truss's new policies come through, we are taking the unusual view of updating our paycheck disposable income model for, at a six monthly view. So watch this space. We are going to monitor exactly what comes through in those policies and give a real new local area understanding on what is likely to be in the pockets of people across the country. So we'll talk about that probably more next month. Next month, we're also joined by Rachel again, who's going to be looking at what the transactional data is now showing. And the following month, we will be looking specifically at our next run, um, tranche of survey data, which will look at the outlook to Christmas. So to wrap up, we hope that these insights and the data that we're providing is helping you to understand and navigate the issues being faced. And we'd love to help you more if you need assistance in how best to communicate with your customers, who you should be targeting, where you should be targeting. Please, please get in touch with your account manager. So until next month, thank you for your listening. Thank you.